Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Hello to our Tempo members and our Emerging Women Leaders. Welcome to our Tempo Annual Meeting. So wonderful to see everybody logging on this afternoon. Uh, this is a day of looking back. In fact, it was one year ago this month that we hosted our first Zoom meeting with our annual meeting. And I can remember at the time this was a new technology to us. I know that there was anxiety with this first um, call, but fast forward a year and we are all a Zoom pros. So thank you all for being here today. Needless to say, we've navigated some pretty rough waters over the last 12 months. But like many on the call today and um, all companies in Milwaukee, we've reimagined our virtual our organization in a virtual world. Um, we've met our members where they are, whether it's professionally or personally. So we will spend a portion of our time today looking back on Temple's response to the world around us. But this is also a day of celebration for Temple as we set uh, sunset on, yes, a challenging and uncertain year, but also an incredible year of success. We will distribute our 2020-21 impact report later this month, and it provides a really great snapshot, great uh, overview of the last 12 months, as well as an update on our 2023 strategic plan. So I encourage you, I highly recommend you page through the, uh, this wonderful impact report and celebrate with us. And I hope you are as inspired and energized as I am with all that we have accomplished. The impacts of 2020 continue to shake our world and our community as we all are feeling that. And yet the pandemic, job losses, civil unrest and political upheaval have also created and served as a critical wake up call for many individuals and organizations. At Tempo and the events of the past year were a catalyst for us to really look inward. And we learned, we unlearned, we spoke up, we showed up, and we reimagined how we provide value to our 462 members, as well as our 269 emerging women leaders. And collectively, the Tempo team, um, our fabulous Tempo team, our board of directors, our committees, our members, our many sponsors, our many community partners have made these triumphs possible. So we are grateful to you. Thank you for your commitment to this organization. Um, and we extend our gratitude towards you. As our new brand states, the world moves when women rise and together we have risen up and we will end the year more resilient than when we started. So a little about today's webinar, we have a very robust agenda, so a lot of things to get through. We will work to end the business portion of today's meeting right around 12.30 and spend the following hour with five amazing Tempo and Emerging Women leaders sharing their reflections on the past 12 months. And then in addition, for the fourth year in a row, we will announce the recipients of our continuing education grant made possible by the Tempo Foundation. And finally, many of you joined us in December when we unveiled a new look for our Temple brand. I continue to be energized by our Temple brand's evolution and how it represents our organization's past, it represents our present and our future. And today we have exciting developments for you, one that our members have been asking for, one that may have something to do with a little retail therapy. So stay tuned for that announcement. Um, a few housekeeping items. Um, you all know Zoom. We've muted everybody. We've um, disabled your videos, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. So the chat function will be critical as we ask our Temple members to cast their votes if you have not already done so um, for the board slates that we will present. So please, please use the chat function to um, cast your vote as a yay or a nay um, when our board chair, Roy Richards, calls for the vote. Um, so. And if you have any questions, um, again, use the chat function to ask those either during our annual meeting portion or for our um, uh, is dis distinguished panelists um, during our program portion. So before I turn it over to board chair, Lori Richards to share her reflections as she steps down as our board chair of Tempo, I just wanna say a huge, huge thank you, Lori. Although this doesn't um, even begin to express my heartfelt gratitude to you and your leadership. 
I don't think um, either of us anticipated <laughs> this incredibly heavy lift that was going to be when you accepted the position a year ago to lead our board and our organization in 2020 and 2021. It has been an incredible honor serving alongside of you and learning from you, continuing to build this organization together. We have been through quite a bit, uh, quite a lot. I've learned so much from you and you have this uncanny ability to remain calm, cool, and incredibly collected even when faced with incredible hurdles. So I thank you for your leadership, uh, your unwavering commitment to Tempo, but most importantly, your friendship. So with that, I will turn it over to our board chair, Lori Richards. Thank you, Jen, and thank you so much for your introduction. Um, maybe the, we, the stars aligned in some weird way, but maybe you just, uh, you also, when you, when you chose a crisis communicator as your incoming board chair just before a global pandemic. So <laughs> in some ways it all worked out, um, but no doubt today is a bit of a bittersweet day for me as my last meeting. Uh, as your Tempo board chair. So um, good afternoon. Thank you to all of us, uh, for, to all of you for joining us this afternoon, both Tempo members and emerging women leaders. I've been asked to share some of my reflections as board chair, which I will do shortly. But first, given that this is our Tempo Milwaukee annual meeting, we have a bit of business to conduct, including confirmation of our 2021-22 board slate for our Tempo Milwaukee organization, as well as for the Tempo Foundation Board. So bear with me as we get through just a bit of business um, and then on to the program. But before we dive into business, I would like to recognize and thank our current Tempo Board members and especially our Tempo team. So as you all know, that is uh, made up of Jen Dirks, Marit Harms Franzi, Kelsey Arrigan, our newest Tempo Milwaukee team member, Partivi Desai, and our intern, Diavion Lyons. So thank you so much to all of you as a team. And I need to say this, at the close of this crazy year, you have led us all through a very difficult year. I know you felt and lived it every scary and uncertain moment of 2020 and carried so much weight and responsibility on your collective shoulders as our Tempo team. And I hope today is a day that you allow yourself a moment of reflection and celebration. Jen, I love the tone that you kick this off with. It is really kind of a, an important day to turn the corner and celebrate all that we accomplished last year for all that you have done to lead Tempo through this past year. We've made it and we're stronger now because of the leadership and the grit that you've shown this past year. So on behalf of all of our members and our board, a special and heartfelt thank you to you, Jen, and our Tempo team. I also want to thank our committee chairs and vice chairs on this call as well. I want to extend, again, my true gratitude for all of your leadership and especially the guidance and counsel that you have provided to me and to this organization over the last 12 months serving as board chair. Uh, again, I think this role always presents unique challenges, but especially when you layer it on top of the year that we had and at every phone call, at every turn with every email, you all have stepped up to support the organization and support me through this leadership year. And lastly, as we all know, perhaps the greatest value and benefit of Tempo is the network that we continue to build of phenomenal female leaders. Tempo would be nothing without its members. So I also want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support and engagement. We value your membership and appreciate your commitment, your guidance and your feedback to make this organization better. I think each year we acknowledge what we, that without your input and support, we would not exist. But <laughs> this year, truly the reality is that many nonprofits were pushed to the brink in 2020, but because of our membership and your loyalty, and again, the, the, the value and, and commitment that you've shown, we move through this year steady and strong. <clears throat> One of our goals as a board and as leadership for this organization is to remain as transparent as possible about the evolution of tempo. So we're often asked, 
how does one get engaged with our organization? Or how does one become a Tempo Committee Chair, a board member, or a decision maker? So my first answer to them is there is no shortage of engagement opportunities here at Tempo. As with many development opportunities, however, committing the time to make the most of your membership will yield the best return on your investment in Tempo. So that could be as simple as committing to a program meeting or deepening your investment with a mentor circle or professional development opportunities committee work or one of our signature events. As we'll soon highlight, <clears throat> engagement opportunities greatly expanded in 2020. But second, I would encourage you all to just raise your hand. If you're interested in serving on a committee, being a board member, or you have aspirations for, um, for beyond that uh, within our board, please just let us know. There are many willing members of the board and of committees, if you already sit on one, that would be more than willing to help kind of pave that path for you. Third, we have a nomination committee who's actively assessing our engaged members and identifying leaders to carry our organization into the future. Now you'll note engagement is one of the clear signals to this nomination committee that you may be interested in or a great fit for additional leadership opportunities. Finally, if you have any questions about member engagement, it's really just as simple as reaching out. So never hesitate to reach out to myself, Jen Dirks, or another member of the Tempo team. Okay, at this time, I think we may have some slides. We're going to jump into and start conducting the annual meeting of Tempo. So a week ago, Tempo members received via email a request to vote on the proposed board slates for Tempo. If you have not already cast your vote via email, we ask that you do so today using the chat function. So after I review the slates, please indicate yay or nay, your yes or no, using the chat function. We'll tally up those results as well as those, add them to the ones that we received last week via email and get to you with the final results before the end of the meeting. So the 2021 board slate for Tempo Milwaukee can be seen on your screen. There are seven proposed positions for officer, director, and director at large up for election at this time. The proposed board slate includes board chair, Devona wright Cottrell, board vice chair, Mary Burgoon, Board Treasurer, Mary Robin Piotter. Board Secretary, Julie Granger. Director of Diversity and Inclusion, Alia Berman. Director of Membership, Anna Simpson. And Director at Large, Denise Thomas. I see some I I yeses already, so thank you for that. We also have four current directors and directors at large whose three-year terms are up for renewal. They are Mary Beth Cottrell, Chris Best, Kathy Campbell, and Heather Turner Loth. <clears throat> also, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to, to thank two outgoing directors at large who have served our organization so well. Not only did these women provide strong leadership, business acumen, and diversity of thought to our board, but they provided me personally with a great deal of support and advice during my time at, within Tempo. So on behalf of Tempo, tremendous thanks to Jody Lowe and Paula Pergel for their contributions to the Tempo board. You will be greatly missed. Now on next to the proposed board slate for the Tempo Foundation. The 2021 Tempo Foundation board slate can be seen on your screen and includes six proposed positions for directors at large up for election at this time. So we are voting for Foundation Board Chair Mary Ellen Krieger, Foundation Board Vice Chair Ellen Bartell, Foundation Treasurer Mary Robin Piotter, Foundation Secretary Mary Dowell, Foundation Director at Large, Directors at Large, excuse me, Ann Maletti and Felicia Paris. Very good, I see voting is continuing, excellent. Finally, we have a couple of quick bylaw changes as well that I want to outline and describe for you quickly. So the bylaw changes one and two call for splitting the existing secretary treasurer role 
into two distinct board directors and executive committee roles. So rather than a combined, we will have one person serve as secretary and a second serve as treasurer. The third change will affect those board directors who serve as committee chairs by extending their roles serving in these committee chair positions to serve two year terms versus one year terms. And then lastly, the fourth proposed bylaw change is a clarification of the treasurer role as now defined to include also serving as the committee chair of the finance committee. Very good. So I see a lot of chat votes being taken. Given this, Jen, jump in here if you yeah, want me worry. to also do a voice vote, but I feel like. Yeah, let's um, let's hold off. We still have a couple coming in. Um, maybe share your comments and then we can regroup in a little bit and we can Perfect. Um, give you the results. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for to all of you for your active uh, participation in this uh, this process. As you all know, this is my last tempo program meeting as board chair and truly my only feeling of sadness today, though it is a bit bittersweet, is that I'm still addressing you all via video as I did in my very first message to you one year ago. However, there's so much to be excited about. I, like many of you, will be fully vaccinated in a matter of days and am watching as the Zooms begin to disappear from my calendar and the in-person meetings begin to reappear on my calendar. For literally only the second time in a year, I am wearing a dress today, even though you can't see it. And that seems to be a victory to me. Um, and as you all just voted on, Tempo and our foundation are very well positioned with our future leadership structure solidly in place. But let me quickly take you back in time. When my role as board chair was announced about 18 months ago, I remember bumping into a fellow Tempo member who asked me, so have you been thinking about it? What, what is going to be your legacy with Tempo? And I remember feeling a little off guard and candidly a little overwhelmed. Gosh, was I expected to step into this role with a complete vision to transform the organization? Or did I need to come up with a memorable change or initiative to make my time as board chair really unique? Uh, when I consulted with the all-knowing Tempo Network with this quandary, a wise and maybe all-knowing past president advised me, and I will never forget this advice, to just be open to what presents itself. Well, Tammy Garrison, you have no idea how right you were. The world went big on presentation in 2020, shall we say. But here's what I learned in all seriousness. Um, I'm not sure legacies are created in one year or by one person, but this role this year, board chair of Tempo Milwaukee, was all about impact. So impact acknowledges big vision, but impact also is about responding to the conditions around you. Sometimes impact is most effective through small changes that over time make a big difference. I thought that theme was really relevant and actually it was a word that was on my mind quite a bit, even before Jen told me that Tempo had prepared and will be sharing with you the impact report distributed later this month, because that's truly how this year felt. It felt like leadership was most, uh, most appropriate for the organization when focused on the little impact we could have to affect the change and react to the change that was happening all around us in the world. So you will be getting an impact report, as Jen mentioned earlier this meeting, later this month. But in the meantime, and in celebration of closing out our fiscal year, I wanted to just give you a couple of quick highlights, and I will try to keep it brief, of Tempo's impact during 2020. As you know, we continue to be driven by the four pillars of our strategic plan. They're really at the heart of everything we do, driven specifically by member experience. And at the board level, we've introduced and monitor a dashboard monthly to ensure that we stay true to these pillars. Growth of the organization continues to be a priority even through an uncertain year. As the pandemic unfolded and uncertainty grew, we were prepared for membership to decrease. In fact, 
the opposite happened. We had a record number of women leaders joining Tempo this past year, 93 new members, including 13 emerging women leaders who transitioned to Tempo membership. Currently, our membership sits at 459 Tempo members, and that reflects an 89% retention rate, even during this past year. Emerging Women Leaders currently stands at 269 members, reflecting a 94% retention rate. And there's a new class joining soon. That to me speaks to impact. Those levels of retention are a strong signal back to Tempo that uh, there's value in the programming and that members are really getting a lot out of their Tempo experiences. As I mentioned for the past several years, and so happy that this continued through 2020, we have welcomed record numbers of new Tempo Milwaukee members. And while there's strength in numbers, this year we also celebrated our, our, well, we celebrated our greater collective voice, but also really tried to acknowledge the unique contributions of each individual member. So programming, our programming expanded from our traditional offerings, as you all know, given the Zoom world that we live in and included things now like Tempo Talks, Third Thursday programming and additional professional development opportunities. Engagement opportunities also grew during 2020 with things like coffee connections, uh, the, the new Tempo Walks, and we see we continue to see very strong participation in mentor circles and one-on-one -on -one mentoring between the Tempo and EWL groups. Our commitment to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion deepened during 2020, which was a huge impact. During this past year, six, we, Tempo Milwaukee saw a 6% increase in women of color joining our organization. We also increased our programming with content that supported individual members of Tempo to take on their own DEI journeys. Those supports included our Tempo Real Talks, things like acknowledgement of and participation in the Day of Understanding, which the, the DEI committee just did a great job through a Tempo Real Talk yesterday. We also engaged in exciting new collaborations with groups like ALUM, MMAC's Region of Choice, CEO Action, and Milwaukee Film, all regarding DEI work. And we're inc incredibly encouraged that these groups are reaching out to temp Tempo. And we feel like that symbolizes and acknowledges progress in this important area of growth for Tempo. We also continued to see growth in 2020 in our collaborations and community involvement. As you all are likely familiar, that includes the Women's Affinity Alliance, as well as the Women's Leadership Collaborative, which is our partnership both with Professional Dimensions and Milwaukee Women, Inc., focused on the issue of pay equity. We also saw continued activity and growth in the Temple Foundation and impact on our community through scholarships and continuing education. So one last incredible indicator of our impact, and I want to elaborate on, on that last point, is the work of the Tempo Foundation. As mentioned earlier, we'll now reveal the winners. I'm going to call on Jody Lowe to join me here in just a moment to reveal the winners of the fourth annual Tempo Milwaukee Foundation Continuing Education Grant. So to share more about today's awardees, please join me in welcoming Jody Lowe, past chair of our foundation board to announce the recipients. Thanks so much, Lori. I'm so glad to be here. I'm Jody Lowe with the Lowe Group and I'm filling in for Joanne Gruno, the, the chair of our foundation who was unable to be with us today. For those of you newer to the organization and for those of you familiar with our Tempo, uh, unfamiliar with our Tempo Foundation, let me provide a little background. The Tempo Foundation was established as a 501c3 charitable organization in 2011 and has provided more than $300,000 in college scholarships to undergraduate female students. It also exists thanks to the generous support from Tempo members, EWL leaders, and corporate partners and community supporters. In 2017, we unveiled the evolution of our foundation with our continuing education grant, which awards up to $15,000 to one or multiple recipients to cover leadership, 
training, or other programs for established professional women who wish to take their careers to the next level. Recipients can be Tempo members, emerging women leaders, and other women from within our community. Today, we are excited to announce the three recipients of this year's continuing education grant. They are Macy Hare. Macy received a grant to enroll in Yale's Women's Leadership Program. Catherine Schober. Catherine received a grant to enroll in Carnegie Mellon University's Robotic Academy. Wow. And finally, you may re recognize our final recipient from our Emerging Women Leaders Program, Becca Sergis. Becca received a grant to enroll in Amy Einstein's, Einstein's Mastering Major Gift Fundraising Program. Join me in congratulating each of our recipients today, Macy, Catherine, and Becca. And a special, special thank you to our judges and our Tempo Foundation Committee for making today a reality. Thank you so much, Jody, and thank you to introducing us to this amazing group of women leaders. What a privilege to be able to have an impact on their professional journeys. All right, Jen, uh, without further ado, wondering if we can check in on a final tally of the results of the Tempo vote based on those email ballots as well as the voting in the chat. Yes, Lori, thank you. We have received a motion to approve and a second based on votes received from our members both via email and on um, today's call, the motion to elect a new Temple Board slate, a new Temple Foundation Board slate, as well as revisions to our bylaws has passed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jen. Well, again, as I look to close out this term with Tempo Milwaukee, um, I just wanted to share a few sentiments about the past year. Helping guide Tempo through a unique year in the organization's history has had a profound impact on me this past year. For anyone looking for growth opportunities or additional engagement within Tempo, I need to tell you this. This is one of the hardest working highest performing organizations that I have ever had the pleasure of engaging with. And I never for a second doubted that 2020 could throw a challenge at this organization that we couldn't navigate together. Again, I wanna reiterate my thanks to the leadership of my, my, my other board directors, uh, to Jen Dirks and the rest of the Tempo team. Um, it was truly a pleasure to help you navigate 2020 together with Tempo. And to those of you that are members uh, of Tempo and to members of EWL, if you are looking for examples of how to lead, look to Tempo. If you are looking for a network to support you because you have aspirations of how to grow, Tempo is here and stronger and more well-connected than ever. I'm incredibly proud of what we accomplished this year and that we stand here together, larger, stronger, more diverse, and as I see it, more united than we've ever been in our purpose as an organization. And if you haven't noticed, we've shown this pride very visibly in a new way this year in our tempo look and feel, uh, which was another major accomplishment of this past year. So in December, we organized, or I'm sorry, we announced the launch of our Tempo brand refresh. It's an exciting evolution of our organization at the same time paying tribute to our 46 year history. All of this brand work would not have transpired without the leadership of our communications chair, Rebecca Ehlers, and support from our vice chair, Denise Thomas, along with the all female led team at our marketing agency, Bader Rudder. Here today from Beta Rudder is Tempo member Linda Hogan. Linda, thank you so much for all you have done to support Tempo this past year. And please take it away to announce another exciting development with our Tempo brand. Thank you, Lori. Uh, appreciate that. Um, we've all been thrilled to see the new Tempo brand look and voice emerge during our 46th year. Now, we're even more excited to explore how we can bring our story to life for a larger audience. 
Through a new video project, we will tell the story of the Tempo organization by bringing to life your personal stories. Through authentic conversations, we'll learn about your struggles, your triumphs, and your insights on women in leadership. With each story, a picture emerges revealing the power of women coming together. Just like the women of Tempo, modern tintype photography upends and exceeds expectations. The juxtaposition of a classic technique against each woman's modern hair and wardrobe creates a visual tension that challenges traditional assumptions in beautiful ways. We will go, we're going to be working with renowned local artist, Margaret Musa, whose work you may have seen at the Pfister Hotel when she was their artist in residence. The video will reveal each photo throughout the process. As we see each woman's striking portrait develop before our eyes, we'll cut away to hear her unique story. So how do we make this even bigger? A public exhibition revealing our stunning portraits and stories allows Tempo to connect our experiences and our impact to a larger community. We'll be reaching out soon to hear your story and selecting a few to feature in the Tempo video project. We're excited to hear from you, so please stay tuned. And finally, something we're very excited about. Um, you asked, we delivered. I am thrilled to announce the new Tempo Shopify store is live. Right now, you can go to temporiseshop.com to show off your Tempo pride. We'll add more items in the future, but right now we have t-shirts, wine tumblers, and masks ready to order. Thank you for this exciting opportunity to work with such an amazing organization. Um, my team at Beta Rudder has been thrilled and honored, and we're excited to see this all come to life and have Tempo have an even bigger impact on the community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Our brand is stronger than ever, and a, and at a very significant time for women in the workplace. Thank you for continuing to be the voice for female leaders in the Milwaukee community. We know our organization starts with you, our Tempo members. So thank you for your continued commitment to this organization. We have amazing members who continue to volunteer their time and showcase their leadership on our Milwaukee committees and with our signature events. You all are amazing and we're so very proud. Thank you. Finally, lastly, we open a new era today. I take no greater pleasure than in formally welcoming our new board chair, Devona Wright Cottrell, who thanks to our members uh, has voted her into the board chair role. I am thrilled for Tempo to have such an incredible leader at the helm for the next 18 months and thrilled for all of you, if you don't already know Devona, to have the chance to get to meet her and work with her more closely. That concludes our 2021 annual meeting and we can move on into the programming that we have in store for you all today. So again, thank you to our Tempo members and Emerging Women Leaders for spending this hour with us. And with that, I'm gonna shift gears quickly and introduce you to a one Miss Beth Ridley, today's moderator. All right, well, thank you so much, Lori. And Lori, I do wanna say um, thank you so much for the impact that you have had on Tempo and also the impact that you have on me personally as a friend. Um, you are so inspiring to know and it's been really inspiring to see your leadership in action. So thank you. Um, all right, so I'm really excited about today's program. It's gonna be fun because we're gonna take a look back from a year ago today when Tempo was thrust into the world of virtual programming back when people were like, what Zoom? Um, and now we've gotten so comfortable with it, but um, as a member of the programming committee, I am so proud at how this committee was able to quickly pivot and get really creative over the past year so that we can not only continue our programming, but I think that we've really plussed it up to be able to continue to provide really valuable, um, impactful content. So um, I want to give a big shout out and a big thank you to everyone who serves on the programming committee. 
Thank you for your work. All right, so how this is going to work is that um, first I'm going to introduce each of our four panelists and they're going to talk for five minutes and just share their reflections over this past crazy year. So they'll reflect on what they were thinking and feeling a year ago, um, what lessons they've learned over the year, any changes that they've implemented because of the lessons that they've learned either personally or professionally, and what do they hope to see moving forward. Um, and then after each of our panelists speaks, we'll bring everybody together and I'll moderate a discussion with all of us and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. All right. So without further ado, I'm gonna get us started here. And um, the first panelist who I'm going to introduce is Maggie Dawn. So Maggie's gonna give her personal reflections first. A little bit about Maggie. So she served as our first Tempo Talk speaker back in April, 2020, when she raised her hand to speak to Tempo and EWL membership on all things COVID at the county level. So Maggie truly sparked the Tempo Talk series and set the stage for what was to come over the, over the past year. Maggie currently serves as Corporation Counsel for Milwaukee County, and she's been a Tempo member since 2017. All right, Maggie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Five minutes. So again, what were you thinking and feeling a year ago? Uh, what have you learned over the year? Changes that you've embraced personally or professionally and hopes for uh, what you see moving forward. Well, thanks so much. It's, it's really exciting to be here. I cannot believe it's been over a year since we've all been um, in various ways in our different professional capacities and personal capacities working virtually. Um, for those of you that know me, you probably know me as someone who um, is radically candid about a lot of things. And I'm sure I'm, there are some virtual chuckling going on on that side of the camera. And so um, I definitely don't wanna make um, my five minutes a story about me, but I did wanna sort of share really vulnerably um, a bit about what was operating in my world and the challenges that I was facing. Um, so the year 2020 began for me with a very public political fight that I sort of got sucked into and there was some interesting articles that were running in the Journal Sentinel. I moved right from that into a fairly, again, public fight that my office had a role in trying to moderate over who is going to be on the county executive's spring general election ballot, where some of my bosses at the county had um, some vested interests in, in who appeared on that ballot. We went right from there into COVID um, and then the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. Obviously, um, my office had a huge role in, in COVID planning and it was planning without any model. As we all have experienced, we literally were making it up as we were going along. And obviously the county has a deep and important role in trying to achieve health equity and racial equity and being attuned to the needs of our different communities. So it literally were matters of life and death, um, both with respect to COVID and racial justice protests that were happening. And we were working in basically like a seven day a week cycle, largely 10 or more hours a day. Um, I then failed to send in my continuing education paperwork to the state bar on time, which resulted in some more embarrassing press, which is like the last thing you need. Um, from that went into some really serious health issues for close members of my family, a couple of people on staff. Uh, the election happened, we went into a recount, the county's um, election results were challenged in multiple different lawsuits. My office led the defense of that. Um, there were a couple other cancer diagnoses. There was a suicide in my family. Um, and I was diagnosed with COVID in January. Um, I broke my ankle in February. And one of my deputies who has been a dear friend to me and um, my, my right and left brain in my office passed away unexpectedly um, just last month. So when I look back on these some 16 months, it has been um, 
a harrowing experience to say the very least. And I often felt personally like I was failing everyone in some way, Th that my staff or my fellow leaders needed me in, in various ways and that I, I wasn't there for them as much as I would have wanted to be. Um, my family needed me in different ways, my friends. And I just, you know, we talk about work-life balance. Well, that doesn't exist and there was no separation anymore. So I felt kind of constantly like I was myself in acute trauma and that the people that I loved and cared about were also in acute trauma. And yet I wasn't quite getting any of it done the way that I would want to get it done. And eventually I had to figure out, I need to start asking for some more help. And so trying to respect not only the lived experiences of those around me, but also my own as a leader, trying to be very attuned to my own emotional state and the assistance and help that I would need and to ask for that help boldly and vulnerably to say to staff, I don't have answers. I have questions, help me. Um, and that can be really lonely, right? Oftentimes leadership is lonely and leadership in moments of crisis when People, frankly, are, are looking at you and judging your ability to adapt and respond um, can be even more isolating and lonely. Um, so it really has been a year of growth, um, of humility for me, um, of really looking inside myself and understanding that unless I put the uh, air mask on myself, I cannot be there to help others to do my job, to serve the community that I love so much in the way that I want. So a lot in there, um, both the challenges and I think some of the lessons that I was able to take and that I hope to share with my staff and encourage my staff to share some of those lessons with each other because we're all in this together. It's amazing that crisis, crisis tends to flatten hierarchies right? <laughs> when you're in the foxhole together, it looks a little different. So that uh, little bit of sharing, I look forward to hearing what my other panelists have to share. And thanks again for having me here. Beth, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Maggie. I love that quote, crisis tends to flatten hierarchy. Um, you touched on so many of the topics that we're going to dive um, deeper into when we're all together, but from vulnerability, resilience, um, equity, diversity, inclusion, so all those topics, but I appreciate your candor. Um, that was definitely a challenging year for you, um, but I will say your Zoom background is gorgeous. like it. Um, thank you. All right, so next I'd like to introduce Jerry Howes. So Jerry participated in our Lessons Learned from Nonprofit Leaders Temple Talks back in May. Jerry serves as executive director for uh, Pearls for Teen Girls, and she's been a Temple member since 2018. Okay, Jerry, your five-minute reflections. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, being someone who, like Maggie, um, is prone to be pretty um, candid, um, but in the spirit of time, I would, Maggie really went over a lot of um, and reminded us a lot of what happened over the past year. And when I think about um, the, this, this past year, there are definitely some, some similar themes. But when I think back to a year ago, um, I was on a high because um, we had just finished our annual event and um, which went extremely successful. And it happened to be the night that the Bucks shut down for the year. So we had exceeded our goals and it was the last event many of us had been to where we got to feel inspired and loved and all that good stuff. So for the most part, a year ago, I was like, okay, so this will be like a snow day. How wrong could I have been? Um, some of the, once we realized uh, that we would have to work remotely and stay remotely, um, 
as the time continued to progress, I realized that the coping mechanisms that I had used prior did not work in this environment. I'm an empty nester who has lived at work for the last year in my apartment. And um, that just not realizing how important it is to be able to be in proximity and connected with others um, and being busy, kept myself very busy. So I didn't have to deal with the things that were frustrating or concerning in my life and um, wound up having a wellness check conducted, um, implemented by two members of my team. And um, after the wellness checked, got me some mental help and re-engaged with my psychologist and um, got me a life coach. And through that work, realized that, um, y'all know what I realized? I realized that what I have forever in my professional career held as my weakness and my deficiency, I actually learned that it was my strength. So I always thought because I didn't have a professional, traditional development path to run in this organization. And I came up from a very crazy story um, that in some way that was a, a deficiency. And because of that, the lesson for me in all of this today is that I get to choose to be present in every single moment and every single encounter. And that includes business, that includes personal. I get to embrace and, and enjoy the community of support that I have, that we all need to do the work that we are here to do. And to take off that mask, when I thought that I never even wore a mask, um, is freeing. And when y'all see me, when the when the when it's all time for us to come together, and I'm fine because these pounds done dropped off. Okay, let me come back and focus. I apologize, y'all. I'm back. Um, so, and as far as with pearls, it all they always say um, you can leadership comes from the top, right? Or a fish stinks from the head, or whatever the case may be. If me modeling and being transparent and vulnerable, all traits that we consider to be weak, doing that through this past year, y'all, with my team, how we have come together to innovate and strengthen our culture and operate as a force that blows my mind. I can't wait till we get to the other side. I am so excited about what all of it brings and I'm just encouraged that through triety, tragedy, we can create powerful triumphs. So I know I'm over my five minutes, but I'm oh. done now. All right. Oh, Mary, preach, preach girl. Well, I, I, do we need to stop? I mean, whoa, inspiring. I'm loving the theme of self-reflection and empowerment. I cannot wait to hear from our other two speakers. Jerry, thank you, so inspired. Okay, let's hear from Maria Perez. So Maria is a licensed psychologist and vice president of behavioral health at 16th Street Community Health Centers. Maria sat on our mental health panel back in May to help attendees better understand what was happening in our brains, this roller coaster of emotions that we we're going through. We finally realized, as Jerry said, this ain't no snow day. This is gonna be, these are some changes that are gonna be lasting here. Um, and how do we take care of our own mental health, which is a big theme that we're hearing. So Maria has been a Temple member since 2019. Welcome Maria, so excited to hear your reflections on the past year. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? 
Okay, I think you guys can hear me. Um, oh boy, that that was such a wonderful, wonderful uh, talk. I just, I just am so honored to be on this panel today. Um, so I'm thinking back about a year. There was just a lot of apprehension that I was feeling. Um, you know, being a, a, a vice president of a big team as I am at the clinic, shifting. Um, I was dealing with a team that was shifting with a lot of fear as they were learning that they needed to work remotely. You know, in the profession of mental health, many of us know that the work is by and large done face-to-face, -face, in person. And so I was dealing with a lot of providers needing to shift their paradigm and work from home and, uh, you know, making sure everybody had laptops and there was just a lot of uncertainty. And, you know, as we shifted to that paradigm of de delivering mental health services virtually, there was a lot of change management that I had to do with my team, as well as within myself. Um, I did not slow down. You know, some people slowed down. We witnessed a lot of folks and, uh, you know, agencies and uh, you know, workplaces shutting down or, or people laying off. Our industry did not slow down, which required me to be in a lot of meetings. And I, I just worked tirely, tirelessly all summer long. So I was just really um, acutely aware of my need to, um, you know, attend to my own self-care. And I know that's the theme of today. It really does seem like a uh, reflection and being catapulted in self-care um, really was a theme for many of us, uh, you know, in our leadership. So it was very busy uh, dealing with providers who were, who were, you know, just really apprehensive about the work and shifting to a different modality, not to mention, uh, dealing with uh, communities that were facing their own depression and anxiety. And I would dare say post-traumatic stress or traumatic stress, nothing post about it. They were living in it in vivo, just a lot of traumatic stress because nobody really knew um, what this pandemic was or meant for us in the short term or the long term. So, you know, it's been really great coming here today because it allows me the opportunity to think about what would I tell my, my April 2020 self, right? I would tell myself, boy, you are about to uh, enter a whirlwind, uh, not only in terms of busyness and change management, but turning a corner in terms of how I needed to prioritize and put myself first. I really needed to um, brace myself for that bumpy ride. And the way that I did that is I started a journey of fitness and commitment to better nutrition. I keep hearing this as a theme too with a lot of my, my, uh, my fellow leaders, uh, women inspired leaders who um, really started to just take that plunge into self-care and that is what I did because that's what that's the way I dealt with it that's the way that I that I was able to sleep better and think better think more clearly is to take care of my body um and knowing that I wasn't adhering to a schedule per se I needed to create a schedule a self-imposed schedule so I have really learned this past year you know given that there was a lot of uh, uncertainty, which I'll talk a little bit about later, um, receiving constructive feedback from those who report to me. I really had to be vulnerable and receptive to receiving feedback, not only from those who report to me, but also from uh, the leadership that I co-lead with. So I really learned the importance of that relationship with myself and being able to take in that constructive feedback and apply it in my life. Um, and I'll wrap up by saying, you know, one year later, one of the biggest changes I have implemented in my professional life is to become more focused on being an inspirational leader. I think there's different kinds of leadership. Inspirational leadership is definitely the direction that I'm trending, um, growing the infrastructure of my department because I can't do it alone. I've really learned to rely on my team and the growing leadership that I am starting to develop under me. So this, this feels really good. Um, in my personal life, I know that I've been the rock of my family. I, I'm, uh, you know, married. I have four children. I have uh, grandchildren. I'm a grandma now for Pete's sake. <laughs> So I've really learned the, 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 the importance of balancing. You know, I learned that my personal life and my professional life are not mutually exclusive. You have to commit to your personal life to excel in your professional life, that those things are intermingled. I, I had COVID-19 late last year, and I learned that my success hinges upon 
a commitment to myself and my own self-care. Not only that, but to my ideals and my principles that, that I cherish. So that is my resolve as we enter into a post-COVID, I don't even know if we can say a post-COVID world yet, but uh, just being having a resolve to develop more leadership around me because we, we all need greater leadership. And uh, very, very happy to just not only co-lead, but be part of this panel. Thank you so much, Maria. So thoughtful. So I love the theme. I think we've all sort of embraced that health is wealth during this pandemic. Um, we can't really um, have the impact that we want on ourselves or others if we're first not prioritizing our health. Um, also love the theme around we've been doing more of integrating our personal and professional lives. But I think all of you are inspiring me like there's a lot of good that can come through a difficult year, but it really starts with self reflection like we got to look inward and, and really have a intentional conversation with ourselves. Okay, so to round us out or bring us home, at least with this first part of the program um, is Lydia Smith. So last year Lydia served on our tempo talks titled juggling act coronavirus gender inequality and the working mom that is heavy um so lydia joined our emerging women leaders group last year and she is the director of diversity and inclusion at Coles. okay so lydia your reflections over the past year thank you beth um I'm going to start like jerry i would say a year ago today i thought it was a snow day basically. Um, single mom with three kids in virtual learning. I was trying to stay sane, um, basically, and telling myself that this would soon and it wouldn't be that long. Things were going to get back to normal. Um, and now here I am a year later, and they are also virtual. One uh, just went back this week. So now I'm managing both and it's still crazy. Um, I today had to make a choice between putting on lipstick or changing my shirt. So I have on a leather coat in full transparency with my pajama shirt, if you all can see this, um, because I had two minutes uh, in between and had to make a choice. And that speaks to what this time has really taught me. And that is, um, I don't think that there's such thing as balance. Um, and I was really creating an unhealthy expectation for myself to balance everything, um, even with the help of an amazing village that I have, it was still impossible for me to balance all the things that I was trying to hold up, being a new leader in an organization at a time when diversity, equity, and inclusion was at the spotlight um, like I said, managing three kids, elderly parents worrying about their safety during COVID, um, a business, and all of these things, it always felt like something was falling and I was holding myself um, to the standard that I had to balance everything. And when I remembered advice that I had gotten years ago at the beginning of my career that we make choices as opposed to trying to balance everything, I started to give myself some grace. And um, I think that is probably the biggest thing, the silver lining from COVID and the thing that has transitioned over into the DEI space is that um, where we've been trying to help people understand vulnerability and empathy um, as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, COVID gave us this, this situation for us to be able to talk about it from a different perspective and to say, we need to apply that same thinking that, that you're giving the same grace, the same space for grace that you're giving the people that are working at home to the, these topics as well. And so um, I think that was my biggest learning. I'm always talking about space for grace, but I have to give that to myself. Um, and then the other thing I think that I am going to be taking away from this time is that uh, I was undoubtedly a social butterfly. I have a, a company called Social X. That's what I do. I network, I talk, I'm around people. That was my safe space. And for those of us that that is our space, when you are forced to be alone and to be by yourself, and you literally have to ask yourself the question, do you like yourself? Do, you, do I like this person that I'm spending 
all of my time with by myself in this space. And um, in full transparency, I didn't like some of the things. And so this time gave me the ability to um, love myself, everything about me, imperfections and all. Um, I wrote a book during this time through journaling and um, just those reflections. And I also learned that I could trust myself. And so much because we're especially growing in our careers and we are networking and navigating and wanting to do so much. So we're out there and we're, we're, we're never still. And being still helped me to realize like I actually have great discernment when I trust myself and when I listen. And if there's anything that I want to take, like as we're starting to come back to the, you know, towards the end or we're starting to get towards the end of this and we're all getting anxious and ready to go back out into the world, back into these spaces with all of these other people and listening and talking, it's to, you know, stay centered on who I am, to listen to myself, to trust myself um, and to know that, you know, I have to take care of me um, first, before I can, you know, be the Lydia that's out in these public spaces, I have to be comfortable with the Lydia that is here by myself at home. Uh, thank you so much, Lydia. Super powerful. Do I even like myself? It's a scary question to ask, but an important question to ask. And by the way, you are rocking the Zoom chic. I love the look. Pajama, top, put a leather jacket and pull it all together. Let's bring all of our panelists together. Okay, well, I don't know what that looks like on your Zoom screens, but I'm gonna assume that we're all, oh, there we go. Um, all right, so I am going to, oh, we're missing someone. Are we missing Maggie? Okay, there we go. All right. I'm here. Uh, okay, and I just see different things on my side. Um, okay. I actually want to pick up on this theme of vulnerability. Now you all expressed that you are by nature very um, candid individuals. Um, not everybody is, but vulnerability is starting to be more embraced as a really essential leadership quality. Um, so I want to get just really like practical for uh, us leaders out here that are listening to you. Um, what does vulnerability actually look like in the workplace as a leader? How do you know when is, um, you know, you don't want to share too much. What is the right amount to share? It can be really scary. And I think, I can't remember who said it was a little bit lonely uh, to do so. Maybe Maggie, that might've been you. Um, so what does that look like practically speaking when you are being vulnerable as a leader? And then also, what have you seen in your own experience, the benefits of being vulnerable? So for those of us who maybe are not quite as candid as you guys are, how do we get better at that? Is it worth it to even try to be more of our authentic selves at work? Um, so Lydia, why don't we start with you? Sure, I, you know, what I um, talk about with our leaders is starting someplace that's comfortable for you. And if that's sharing with the, your team at work, you know, what you did over the weekend, because that's what's comfortable, then do that. Talk about that. And we always get these questions, you know, how do I relate or how do I talk to my teams or how do I do this? And I think people want to jump into the deep end. And it's OK to start with things that you're comfortable with. You know, I'm comfortable talking about my kids they're crazy. I love them and all their stories. And so I can talk about those things and people get this sense for who I am. And now we're create, we're starting to create that space. So my advice to people, you know, even if you aren't the most transparent or the most comfortable, you know, in these types of situations, like start with something that's comfortable with you. Maybe it's a, a show you watch. Maybe um, it's a story from your past and something that you learned, but you feel more comfortable because it was in your past. It, wherever you can get some footing, start there. Don't put pressure on yourself to, to jump in the deep end right away. Mm. So basically you have to try to at least be authentic about being vulnerable as a start. Yeah. Um, Maria, anything to add to that? Oh, Maria, sorry, unmute. Sorry about that. Um, I, I love what Lydia said. I think it's really important to have, you know, speaking of discernment, something that was said that uh, stayed with my 
my thinking pattern here was, you know, being able to trust oneself and having discernment is also it's something you can apply to being vulnerable in the workplace. Because there are times when you have to sort of ask yourself, is it appropriate to say this or is it not? And knowing when to wait and knowing when to proceed, right? So I think that trusting oneself in those moments and really starting with, with things that are, that are um, you know, more, more close to home and maybe commonalities that you share with those around you in the workplace. I'm a very, uh, very much a proponent of authenticity and genuineness to, to begin with. Um, I love, uh, you know, purposely scheduling one-on-one -on -one times with my employees so that I can, you know, uh, share my, my reflections about them and how I view them. And I ask them to give me feedback, candid feedback. And, you know, that works to a greater or lesser degree, but really being vulnerable and asking them to share what their insights are about the leadership and the workplace that they're in. And, and uh, maybe even sharing some insights as to, you know, the challenges of, of leadership with my teams. So they know that I, you know, of my own personal struggles. And I think it's really okay to share those challenges so they know, um, you know, where you're coming from as well. Mm. It doesn't get more vulnerable than proactively asking for feedback, which can be really scary. It is. Uh, Jerry, so I'm curious because you, um, you talked about you really lean in and bring your full self to work. You've really grown into that. What have been the tangible benefits of doing that? Like, like maybe sort of co comparing and contrasting before you felt fully comfortable being yourself at work to a point where you are now being a lot more comfortable. Have you seen um, any tangible benefits of um, leaning into being vulnerable in that, in that regard? Mute. All righty, so absolutely. Um, and I would say um, some of the tangibles have been you know, okay, so let me, my brain is going so fast that I, I want to say so many things at once. Um, the intangibles have been, um, the biggest one right now is we have every single person on our team. There's not one person that's that, you know how we all have them in our offices or corporations where it's those couple of cancerous people who never get the vision, who never, like they always want to spread muckety muck. There's not one on our team and our entire team is working together in an entrepreneurial yet innovative way to support us to achieve our mission and vision and do that in excellence. That is the biggest you thing. Do you attribute that outcome in large part to you being more authentic at work, you being more vulnerable at work? Um, it, 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 that is the start because if the leadership doesn't recognize the importance of it, then it can't have it. Lots of things can happen grassroots up, but to have a culture that requires that we be able to discuss the elephant that's in the room and figure out how to break that puppy down into small bite-sized pieces, that's that has to be um, that has to come from top down, and not that um, the the person the the my role I get to I'm making it happen. I'm creating space, and by me creating space, it allows for space so that my team knows that they can from my team my direct reports to even the youngest team staff on our employees um who is an employee can either acknowledge me and give me good feedback but they can also let me know look that didn't work for me or that like that created a problem because at the end of the day we are all here to achieve the mission and vision so um and as i've said to the team here recently you all, we don't even, like, we are fortunate that we like each other. We didn't come here to become friends. We came here to get this work done and, and getting the work done and working toward it, toward it, celebrating successes, working through challenges, figuring out new side strategies, 
um, we, we've gotten a chance to get to know each other on a deeper level. And um, the, I, I just, I, I can't reiterate enough, not one negative person on our team, everybody gung-ho. And I'm just, y'all, I'm excited. It's a long way to building trust. And I always like to say, as a leader, you don't want to be in the situation of the emperor has no clothes. If you're not vulnerable and create the trust, you know, you, you need to hear the reality of the situation. I like to say somebody always should be telling you got spinach in your teeth. Maggie, um, you talked specifically about asking for help, about having the courage to ask for help. Just a few, a few words of advice. Again, for some people, not so easy to do. I hear you, Beth. Um, and let's reflect for a minute about why it's not so easy to do. Um, many of you know that I spent the first 10 to 15 years of my career as a securities litigator out of New York and abroad. I was punished when I asked for help or said, I'm not sure if I can do this. I think women, women of color, um, LGBTQ plus women, when you say I need help or I need a break or I'm overwhelmed, you know, like Jerry was saying, a lot of people, a lot of men, a lot of white, cis, gendered, older men punish you for that. Oh, this means you can't help it. Expressions of emotion are taken as signs of weakness. So it is not easy and it can be really scary. And it took me acknowledging that I had been through some trauma when I had struggled to express my vulnerability in a workplace. And you kind of get conditioned into almost masculating yourself, right? And like, how, how am I authentically me? I, I, sometimes I don't, I, maybe it was you, Lydia, like, do I like myself? What is authentically me? I sometimes say, oh, I'm really candid. You know, I began by talking about that. I am candid, but I'm also loving and considerate and um, so it's straight talk, but it, it's, it's radical candor with kindness and love. Um, and I think some of this, I think Jerry and Maria, Lydia, everybody's been speaking to, particularly for me at the county, it is mission above myself. And so the first place of vulnerability comes from humility. Mm. I don't know. I am screwing up. I have screwed up. Tell me how to be better. I'll do my best and I won't always succeed. And at times, if you recognize, and I have had to, to come to this reckoning, my own life, my own career, that there have been professional environments and personal relationships that I was in that did not create a safe place for me to be vulnerable where I was getting punished for that. And I took that on as my failure. I internalized that. And it wasn't my failure, we're human. We cannot demand perfection of ourselves. That's part of that self-love, that grace, Lydia. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. right? And I had to say, maybe this isn't the right place for me because if that professional environment punishes that vulnerability, punishes imperfection, is that really the place for me? And this moment of working on inclusion and belonging, um, it, it, it requires also not just the willingness to sort of take those steps and be vulnerable and be afraid. I mean, some of this is just fear. I'm afraid sometimes. But also to say, hey, this isn't working and I, I respect myself enough. I respect my skills enough, what I bring to the table that I need to go find someplace else for me to use my magic superpowers. Um, because we all have that magic and I'm going to do some snaps for black girl magic, especially. So, you know, again, I always encourage people to really engage with what feels safe for you. And is this truly a safe environment? If it's not, is that something I can change as a leader? Can I talk to other leaders about that? And if it's intractable, you've got to respect yourself and love yourself and love the work, your mission, your why enough to maybe look at sometimes moving. It's scary. There's no right answers to doing this. But for me, 
the answer has been found in public service where it is always mission over self. And if I keep that at my heart and at my core, it empowers me to, to work through my fear and to try to remain courageous in that. No, thank you so much for that. I love what you said, sort of at the core of vulnerability is humility. And I think that um, through this self-reflection that you all are doing and a lot of people are doing, we're reassessing our priorities. Now we just have to trust ourselves and know our own value to be able to find that place where we can really bring our full selves uh, forward. Ladies, okay, first of all, I have like a bazillion other questions that I want to ask, but at 1.15, I have a big note that we got to open it up for Q&A. So if other people have questions, let's entertain them. If not, I've got a bunch. And I don't know um, how Q&A is supposed to work. If everybody, if you have a question, just take yourself off mute. Or if you want to put them in chat, I'll kind of try to monitor both. So I am opening up for questions. Well, okay, keep thinking about your questions and I'm gonna go ahead and seed some questions while we are waiting for them to come in. I've got the chat wide open so I'll be able to see when something comes or like I said, interrupt me and unmute yourself because I think it's important that we give um, all attendees the chance to ask questions. I don't wanna completely monopolize. But Maria, I'm really curious from your perspective We've been talking a lot about like the work that we've been doing on ourselves internally uh, to kind of uh, cope and, and um, learn and grow through a challenging year. But what about as a leader, how have you been able to um, help your employees embrace change and build the resilience to um, be able to adapt to the change um, that we're all uh, experiencing and get comfortable with the unknown, which quite frankly, I think is going to be an element of the day-to-day -day for some time. So any practical recommendations on how you have been able to lead others through change? What a wonderful question. Um, so first, I, I really want to just, uh, just applaud uh, the, the question because it really helps to bring it, it, it helps to surface that the fear pieces because we have to remember that leaders are human too. So how do we uh, prepare the teams and our colleagues for the changes that we're going in through? Um, you know, it, it's, it's just, it, it summons up the, the, the reality or the understanding that we ourselves are navigating through fear and uncertainty all the time within ourselves. So yes, um, one, one recommendation, a real quick uh, practical recommendation is we have to emulate and promote confidence. We have to emulate generosity and a joy. We have to emulate joy uh, about returning to a new normal. And, uh, you know, being open about it and being committed to listening and hearing concerns, because I think that those questions and concerns and fears are going to still be trickling down and through our, our workspaces. So we have to be committed to listening, um, modeling and exercising solid discernment between implementing needed changes in your respective organizations while remaining steadfast to processes that must be in place so that we can assure safety and stability because organizations are fluid, but we need, we need some stability as well. Remind your teams of the mission and the vital work and how important they are and the important contributions. That's gonna give them a dose of inspiration. Uh, look for pockets of beer where you can be flexible but know when you need to be firm. I think that that's really important as well. Um, invite uh, ideas and innovations so that uh, you can uh, implement those ideas as you can. And just being willing, as people have been talking here today about being vulnerable and making it a mission to grow leadership in others so that they too can feel empowered because empowering others, we get a whole lot more done and a whole lot more joy spreads in the workplace that way. Mm, thank you, Maria. Really practical, great tips. I love what you said about making sure you're always connecting the work to higher purpose and meaning. I think a lot of times we get in tunnel vision execution mode and we forget to do that. And no matter how hard the work is, if people feel that it is connecting to something more purposeful, that is a great way to have people build the resilience. 
Um, so we did get a question coming in from the chat. And so we're back on the topic of vulnerability and being authentic. So I'm going to pose it and I'd like maybe one person in the interest of time to share. Um, so the question is, as a leader, are you allowing your team to be authentic? If yes, how do you manage that? So I'll go. Um, go for it, Jay. Like I, I don't allow them. I can't allow them. Like I, it sometimes, many times, it feels like I'm working for them as opposed to um, me <laughs> calling every all the shots. But um, it really does boil back down to that: how do I choose to be present, and how do I model um, in real real time? how we practice doing this thing um, of being transparent and asking, um, being inquisitive and asking questions and being open to different perspectives and asking for different um, types of feedback from members who may not um, share as frequently and call out to the quiet ones and um, make space for everyone else, but also how we, um, in between those times, celebrating, um, giving shout outs, or because we're all virtual, um, and I have a way of doing this, and I say it to the team, if I see your green light is on in Teams, I may just pop in just to see how you're doing and, um, and tell them to do the same thing with me. So um, how we practice, what does our core, what does living our core values look like? So how do we practice putting girls first. What does that look like, smell like, taste like, um, assuming positive intent, like all of it. So it's it's being present and being open to all of it. It was even creating space in one of our all staff meetings um, after the murder of George, Flo George Floyd to just, we don't have answers, we, but we want to have space so that if you need to talk about it, here's space where you can say what you want to say about it with no judgment, like creating safe spaces to just know that it's okay to, and that we care. People don't care what you know till they know that you care. So creating spaces for our team to know that we genuinely care um, about their well-being um, because in many instances, all of us are dealing with the same thing and then I'm gonna stop talking, but we all had to process all of life at the same time and um, while getting the jobs and work done. So mm -hmm. those were- Yeah, I like that. So what I heard you saying is you don't have to have all the answers, but you just have to be intentional about at least creating the space where people can at least um, share and express themselves. And you know what? A lot of times you don't have to do anything with what they tell you. You just have to listen. Um, so actually, Jerry, I want to stay with you because you have a unique perspective in the sense that you are engaging and working with youth. Um, and so I'm curious that we've talked a lot about like what we've learned as adults, but what have you observed ab about children during this really challenging time? Um, how they've been coping um, and what have you learned from your observation of the teens that you've been engaging with and how they've been coping um, over the past year? Um, observations um, and, and lessons. I won't, I can't say learned, I'll say affirmed um, mm -hmm. that children are so resilient. They just are resilient. And um, when asked this question, I went back to the team to find out so what would you all say that from the girls would be the lessons learned and the reflections and feedback from the girls were, you know, adults complain about the pandemic and how they are trapped, but at least they get to go to the grocery store or they go to work. We're literally isolated and have no voice in what their experiences are and to still be able to figure out how to, um, what did this say? Some silver linings were that so many youth discovered how to start a business and discovered new talents. So I, I, I share that to say 
that even in tragedy, um, everything and everybody wants and needs to be connected to somebody who believes in them. And, um, and the resiliency of youth period over time, resiliency of people who live in poverty, resiliency of people like even for me, okay, we're not about me, it's about the youth. So what I'm affirmed in is that um, as long as we continue to provide the means to support our youth in whatever way that we can, it's gonna be all right. Mm -hmm. We'll get past it, we just have to, be mindful that we're providing space for them to contribute to what life can look like on the other side for them and with our community. That's gonna be our charge. Ladies, I hate to be a party pooper, but we have one minute left. And so I'm gonna let Maggie and Lydia have the last word. I'm gonna have you split the one minute. And I have a question sort of forward looking for both of you. Um, it'll be, not full answers, but just teasers of more of what you're thinking. And hopefully we can invite you back to elaborate. Lydia, the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion. I wanted to dive deeper into that because that's a, been a huge topic over the past year. Quick question for you. As you look forward, are you hopeful that the initial um, recommitment to diversity inclusion that leaders have been embracing is going to be sustainable? I'm optimistic. I, I definitely think so. Um, and I think it's because the difference now that I'm seeing in businesses is they are really working to embed diversity and equity and inclusion into everything they do. So it's not this separate HR task that leaders are responsible for. It's actually ingrained into their responsibilities as a leader into the business that they're trying to drive in multicultural markets or just being inclusive um, and, and more empathetic in general. So I think the more we embed it, the more sustainable it will be. Mm, I like that, thank you. Okay, Maggie, so you get the final word here. And the question for you is we talk a lot about, we're sort of like coming hopefully to the other side of the pandemic. People say that they are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, would you agree with that statement when you um, look at it from the county level? And if so, what, what is maybe one example uh, that you would point to that supports that if you do? Um, I think every single resident and citizen of Milwaukee County and the city of Milwaukee can be incredibly proud of the work of their local governments and their local health departments. Um, having worked at almost all levels of government in uh, the private and public sectors, it is your local government that shows up and has the biggest impact on people's lives. And local government, particularly here in Milwaukee, is filled with people who deeply care um, and who don't come to work with agenda um, and don't come to work because it's going to make them wealthy. They come to work because they believe in the mission and they believe in service to others. That's what encourages me, um, as well as some really good um, psychological help for my depression and anxiety, right? <laughs> those things together and, and taking that strength from those around you, right? Whether it's professional help or those that inspire you every day, this panel. I mean, my shout out to you, Beth, Lydia, Jerry, and Maria. What a privilege to be here today. It feel, I feel better already. So um, I really love and appreciate women in leadership, women that work um, so well together to help lift each other up. And I think everyone can be really proud of what has occurred in local government here in Southeastern Wisconsin, particularly the city and the county over this most challenging year. Thanks, thank you Beth. so much, Maggie. That's wonderful to hear. And thank you for wrapping us up so nicely. Maggie, Lydia, Jerry, Maria, thank you so much for your candor, your vulnerability. Very inspiring uh, conversation. That's thank all you. we have, folks. So thank you. Bye, Anything? everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.